Due Process, recipient of two Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards for Outstanding Talk Show Series and Outstanding Public Affairs Series. Getting spit on in the hallway, being called a faggot, queer, fairy. The harassment was verbal and physical, and it happened in school, a school where he says he was not protected. So Rob McDonald filed suit, the first of its kind in New Jersey, gay bashing in public high schools. It's on the docket for this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual. High schools, they're supposed to be safe havens, but that may not be the case for gay kids. How seriously is it taken by those charged with protecting them? I'm Raymond Brown, and in the next half hour, we'll look at harassment of homosexuals in high schools here and across the country. But first, here's Sandy King with one kid's story and his lawsuit. Raymond, Rob McDonald's story is a hair-raising tale of unrelenting harassment that went on, he says, for years, from verbal abuse to physical assault. He is not the first young homosexual with that kind of story, but he is the first to bring suit in this state, the fifth to file charges nationwide. And there's no way of knowing how many others have stories that sound frighteningly familiar. Uh, getting spit on in the hallway, being called a faggot, queer, fairy. And they came around and went out the entrance, and they're like, you dyke. And she started screaming, you fairy, where's your wand, you fairy? Like all the kids were looking at me. Ripped my clothes, kicked me in the stomach. One kid in particular I know was thrown against his locker on like more than one occasion and called faggot. And they all just started making fun of me at the same time and I had to like ask to be excused and I remember crying down the hallway, Aww. wishing they were dead. <laughs> the stories tend to be remarkably well, similar. You just let's push this whole thing down. Okay, I'm not gonna Real slow, slower. And though Amy and Ryan are now in college doing theater and TV, this is no fiction, no script. The stories they tell are from their own lives, insults and abuse, harassment and violence. Practically the whole elementary school was behind me screaming, very, very. I was just walking there. Oh my God. Like I didn't know what to do. So I just How walked home. That was, that was seventh grade. And gay rights groups say that may be when it starts, but where it becomes unbearable, they say, is in a place where kids should be happy and safe. In high schools all over America, schools like the one that was hell for Rob McDonald. Gym clothes stolen, thrown outside in trash cans, um, being approached in the bathrooms, you know, we'll get you out of school, someone like that, um, being tripped, just continuous harassment. But now, nearly two years after graduation, Rob McDonald is fighting back in federal court. Well, the final attack that's alleged in our, in our, in our lawsuit was Rob was jumped from behind by a student in the hallway. And this student basically attacked him and beat him in the head. And as a result, Rob has lost 80% of his hearing in his left ear. And that's a permanent injury that, you know, that cannot be fixed. And the targets of the lawsuit are not the kids who attacked McDonald, but the school officials who failed to protect him. Constantly putting it on him to go find out who did it. Constantly erecting some kind of barrier. You know, instead of going and, and taking these students and disciplining, disciplining them seriously and saying, look, you have to stop doing this, um, suspension, you know, any number of things that you would expect a school would do, you know, to stop the, you know, the kind of violence that was going on against him. 
Rob McDonald's case um, is one of five cases now that have been brought um, to challenge the failure of a school to address anti-gay violence. Uh, but it's uh, representative of a far larger uh, database out there, if you can call it a database, of really um, horrendous situations in our nation's schools. One of those cases in Wisconsin has already scored a win and a $900,000 settlement. But McDonald says he's after more than money. I just hope that uh, from doing this that, you know, no one else has to go through what I did, you know, through high school. Quite often it starts with name calling. And quite often school officials think that that's not serious and shouldn't be um, addressed all that much. It obviously happens among youth a, a lot because of obviously their ignorance and I think that the school school and education has a lot to do and a lot to play into how that, that gets managed or manifested. Time after time I can tell you with all five of these lawsuits now and with every call I get from every parent it starts with name calling it gets, starts to escalate over time as the school sends the message that it's not going to address the anti-gay bigotry. And that's when it's reported. Too often gay rights activists say it is not. I never told my mother really about the teasing. She knew, like, towards the last year she knew about it. Like when I said I didn't want to go to graduation, she knew I was being teased, but I don't think she knew why. Like I didn't want her to know, but they all thought of me because then she might think it back then because I was like so afraid that she'd find out. As for me, I'm as out as I could possibly be. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I could be any more out, but um, as far as other people, they're still very closeted and very afraid of people. So, and th most of them aren't even out to their parents, and it's like a blessing for them to even come out to the group sometimes to have a place to go. But gay support groups like the one at Montclair State are more common on the college campus than in high school, where both the abuse and isolation are far greater, the intervention far less. I think faculty must have known, but they never like acknowledged it. They were too busy calling me flamey. <laughs> but they'll just tell my mom that the principal wasn't there to speak to. And she saw him like run out the back door. They like avoided us. You've got to nip it in the bud because now we know in case after case, in phone call after phone call, that it always plays out the same. It starts out with that name calling, it winds up with very serious physical assaults. So it's at the name calling stage where teachers can wake up and do something. Parents can wake up and do something. And most especially school administrators can wake up and do something. There are in schools throughout the state programs to promote diversity and tolerance on gender and race and sexual orientation. And though Jefferson Township school officials wouldn't come on camera or talk about the McDonald case, they say they too now have those kinds of programs. But Raymond, the problem according to gay activists may be that discrimination against homosexuals runs so deep and the efforts to combat it too often barely skim the surface. But Sandy, I'm willing to bet there are folks who would say there are plenty of laws on the books. What's all the fuss about? Well, and in New Jersey, we do have such laws. We are one of only 11 states in this country that includes sexual orientation in our anti-discrimination. Law, the problem is enforcement, especially when we're talking about kids and the kind of discrimination that, frankly, is too often dismissed as youthful pranks or boys just being boys. And that may be why the battle is likely to be fought out in the courts. And when we come back, we'll talk to some experts about gay bashing among kids and what schools should be doing to stop it. So stay with us. Uh, gay bashing is pretty dumb. You know, cause, I, mean, I I have nothing against gay people. You know, it's their preference and what they want to you know do. There's a lot of you know talking about it over gay people, and especially in the schools. And like sometimes people think you know I'm being like mean about gay people, but really it's just like a word we use every day. Everybody gets made fun of sometimes, so I don't think they should get punished. They should be like suspended or something. They're wrong for. Uh, you know, picking on people just because they're gay, because they're still humans just like everybody else. They just um, choose not to be with the same, with um, different genders. 
A new study strips the bias bare. It shows that even among otherwise tolerant Americans, decent men and women who don't think they're bigots, there remains a deep-seated hostility towards homosexuals. How often does this hostility turn to harassment, especially in high schools where kids are supposed to be safe? We put those questions to our experts. With me in Trenton, two attorneys, Marianne Oriema, who specializes in legal issues concerning gays and lesbians, Rocky Peterson, an expert in educational law, and in Newark, Mary James Edwards, the South Orange Maplewood School District Diversity Coordinator. Welcome to all of you. Marianne, let me start with you. Uh, our report and Sandy's work seems to paint a picture in which it seems like this kind of harassment, especially in high schools, is pandemic. It's happening everywhere. Is that an accurate picture? Um, I think it happens more than we'd like to think it happens. You have surprisingly uh, tolerance among places where you wouldn't expect tolerance. Um, um, for example, Where does it happen most often, in your opinion? Uh, it'll happen in the high schools and even in the grammar schools. And if it's not, if it's not checked, if it's not told, if children aren't educated that it's wrong, that it's in, inappropriate, that it's unkind and it's cruel, then it's not going to stop. And we as adults have an obligation to educate our children. But there's a general fear in our society that if we tell our children that gay people are okay, then they're going to grow up to be gay. Rocky, you represent a number of municipal entities and education boards, and I'm not going to ask you to name names as to board members or individuals, but do you come across responses when you talk about these issues, some of which do not suggest immediate tolerance? Yeah, sometimes the school boards say, well, how do we know? Nobody tells us about it. When we find about it, we deal with it, but we don't know. The students don't tell us they're being threatened or they're being harassed. We know when finally somebody steps up or somebody unfortunately gets harmed to the point where the parent comes in and says, my student's being bothered or being harassed by other students in the building. Well, Marianne suggests that there's kind of a pervasive fear in some schools, and that suggests that for that to be eradicated, there needs to be a more aggressive stance taken, not just waiting by the boards and supervisors for the thing to surface. Absolutely. Our advice is to try and be proactive about this. Beginning of the year, you have student handbooks, you talk about rights of all the students. You try to have the students in there, have meetings with all the students. If you see as a teacher, try to have a class meeting about it, but try to be proactive. So when something does happen, there's a basis for a while you're concerned about it. Mary, when Rocky talks about being proactive, I think that naturally leads us to turn to you. You're a person whose job it is to coordinate the curriculum and behavior as it relates to diversity. What's a good starting point? A good starting point is making sure that the entire school community is aware of affirmative action policies. Um, when I say the entire school community, sometimes we focus on just teachers and kids, but we must make sure that parents are in, in involved in the equation. Um, a lot of the messages that our young children bring into the schools come from outside of the schools, so we have to make sure that they're part of the process. So I would start out by saying a handbook and good education about um, ways in which we can stop biased behavior. And then there are so many other programs uh, that we can involve staff, students, and parents in to um, make them more tolerant around diversity issues. Mary, one of the interesting things that we've all, I think, read about recently is a study out of Princeton University that suggests that even among people who are otherwise pretty tolerant, with respect to the issue of homosexuality, attitudes harden. When you deal with this question in terms of diversity and the broad range of issues, do you find the same response on homosexual questions as you do on racial questions or religious questions? Or is it a, a tougher nut to crack? Um, I would say it is a much tougher nut to crack uh, because I, I guess the whole idea of having a different sexual orientation, you're looking at religious issues, you're looking at values, and people are kind of, it's difficult for them to look inwards uh, at but where these messages are, are coming from. Um, just, just let me say just a little bit more. It is difficult, but it's not impossible to work on these issues. And when we do our diversity work in the district, we move issues of homophobia to the center and we include that as, as much as all of the other isms. Miriam? I think that some of that fear is that it presupposes that gay people are not moral, that they don't have values. We do. A lot of us are raising children now, and that's why I think it's even more important that we educate um, heterosexual parents and children in the schools and teachers, because there is, uh, there is going to be and is now, or are now, children in the schools who are the product of lesbian parenting or the product of gay male parenting. Thing. And, and I would suspect that they will be the next wave of bias attacks if we don't do something now to educate people that we too have family values, we too are moral, we are not out there to molest children or predisp or 
pull children into our lifestyle. No, no, no. We want to coexist with everyone else just like everyone else wants to coexist. And there's too many myths and biases about what we're about. So if you get to know us, um, you'll find out that we're just like everyone else. Well, Mary, you and Rocky, uh, let, let me put, put you a, push you a little bit. Let me forget about your districts mm -hmm. where you're personally involved. Do you really believe that statewide uh, that every district and every school board and every person in a supervisory p position is devoting adequate resources to attacking this problem in comparison to other problems that we've talked about publicly for a longer period of time, like race and religion? I'd have to say no. Okay. I would have to be honest and say no, and I base that upon the number of phone calls that I get around this issue, people not knowing what to do or um, wanting to focus on just race and, and uh, race, racism and sexism and not deal with the homophobia. So um, stepping outside of my district, I would have to say, as long as um, it isn't in their face, then it isn't addressed. And that sort of brings us back to the case we're looking at today where if there's fear, if it happens on a student level and if it doesn't confront administrators in a way they can't avoid, then the issue never gets addressed until perhaps litigation ensues. That's the hardest thing. The boards are being told, okay, you've got to deal with this. But they also say, how do we know that it exists? We have a program in place. And unfortunately, sometimes the boards equate, we have a program in place with the idea, we don't have to tell anybody anything. We have a program in place, we have a book out, that's all we've got to do. So when a complaint comes to a teacher, it's up to the teacher to decide whether or not it's harassment has to be addressed by the district, by the building administrator. And sometimes teacher says, well, it's just, again, like I said before, boys be boys, kids are playing, and maybe they're overreacting to it. And the other idea has to be the student who's affected has to be able to say and feel comfortable in saying, I'm being harassed, and know there's somebody they can go to. to Why wouldn't that? then a, a, somebody observing this be justified in concluding we're not going to make progress on this issue because a broad range of Americans in their heart of hearts really aren't sympathetic to the concept even of equal treatment for homosexuals and unless, as you suggest and as Mary suggests, there's aggressive activity on the part of boards and supervisors and others, nothing's going to happen. Why isn't it fair to conclude this problem's going to be with us for a long time in its present form because nobody's going to act? Well, I think what will happen, actually, the courts are forcing the board to do something. They have to be proactive. Now, they may not want them intellectually and inside and to go home and change their attitudes, but certainly with regard to board policies and administration and building policies, they will have to change their attitudes about this. I, I, Mary, I, I, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. I was going to say, you would hope that um, adults and children would do the right thing and treat um, everyone equally. But the reality is sometimes you have to have policy in place. Sometimes you have to have accountability. Um, adults need to know that you cannot turn your a deaf ear when you hear name calling, that you have to act. It's the law. It's not a choice. Now, Those there was this $900,000 settlement in Wisconsin in a case in which a young man had been harassed on a continuous basis and there'd been no protection and intervention. As, is that talked about in educational circles? Is that something that's causing folks to refocus on this issue at all? I think it's going to be talked about more and more, but it hasn't been talked about that much. At least not on the boards I've intended. I think that cases like mm -hmm. those are going to result in more plaintiffs. Um, obviously, the man in Jefferson Township was probably um, happy to hear what was what happened in that Minnesota case, and it probably gave him the courage to come forward. Uh, more recently, uh, the Boy Scout case with Mr. Dale, I'm sure now we're going to see more activity in broadening the concept or the availability of the public accommodation and gazing in filtering into all societies or at least being making it more obvious that we are everywhere we are here and we're not just hiding behind a facade but let me come back to something Rocky mentioned a minute ago if you're black your parents know you're black exactly. if you're gay your parents may not know and that puts in a lot of pressure on a exactly. kid who's asked to go to the pre to a teacher mm -hmm. or a supervisor when in mm -hmm. fact he hasn't reconciled himself or isn't ready to come out or announce it to the world, mm -hmm. that's putting an awful lot of pressure on a kid who, number one, doesn't want to deal with the peer pressure of being a rat to begin with, mm -hmm. and then may not be ready to announce to the world that he's a homosexual. So how, how do we deal with that mm -hmm. issue? Because it seems to me, Rocky and Mary, there's some obligation to reach that child as well, isn't there? Yeah. And, and that's where the need for support is so important, to make sure that not only parents and teachers know um, the law, but students know as well, and to provide them with a place where they can go, or guidance counselors or someone that they can talk to to give them that extra support. And that is part of the problem, that um, young people don't want to come out to anyone because they don't know who to go to. They don't know who to trust. And so it is very risky. One of the things you want to do is identify a person in the building 
who that person, who the person can go to and talk to. Not necessarily to be a gay person, it just has to be somebody they know, that person is responsible for addressing that kind of issue, privately, confidentially, it's not going to be all over the school, and that person has a chance, at least initially, to address that part of the issue. I think the mm -hmm. other point that needs to be made is, it's not only people who are young people who are gay who know they are gay, there are a lot of children out there struggling with their sexuality or who may appear to be gay, who mm. may be perceived as gay, yeah. who are not and who are subject to the same harassment. And our education needs to point that out to the, the general population. Right, let me ask you if you know whether or not on a broad scale gay support groups and activists, people who've made it their job to address these issues in a social and political way, are finding a welcome in the schools as people who could provide either education or challenge or maybe even additional counselors as the kind of Rocky described. My, my opinion, and, and I can't say that it's, it's, it's based in, in fact, it's my perception that when it comes to the high school level, that no, those people are not welcome because there's the fear, and again, the mythological fear uh, that homosexuals, gays, and lesbians are pedophiles. We are not. Um, and so I think we're excluded from the, the high schools because they're afraid we're going to recruit rather than educate. And that's an absurdity, but it's an absurd myth that exists. Mary, how does that sound to you, that there may be fear in some places that gay activists who want to come and be part of the dialogue in the school are really there for some sinister purpose and might not be welcome? What's your feeling about that? I believe that feeling does exist, but I can tell you that at our high school, at Columbia High School, we do invite um, PFLAG parents and friends of gay and lesbian gay and lesbians into our schools to be a part of our program. Um, and it's important that young people hear that um, more positive messages about gay and lesbian people from, from friends and, and family. Rocky. Yeah, but the concern would be when you have them in the classrooms, when you have them have an auditorium meeting, who goes to the meeting, who gets identified as going to the meeting, and they have the problems afterwards. So the school has to recognize that issue also. That brings to mind one of the things that disturbed me about the allegations in the McDonald's suit, and it's important to keep in mind they're still just allegations, and that is that when administrators did confront the problem, they confronted it by allegation, by saying to the young man, you change in a separate bathroom, or you leave class early, which seems to me to impose a stigma. And Mary, when there's the need for imaginative responses do you have a sense that there is enough training going on so that throughout the state there'll be people who can be imaginative in their response and not in effect stigmatize a kid who's already behind the eight ball I don't see that as being very imaginative to me that's denying equal access um, you shouldn't have to walk on eggshells if your program is in place and you're educating people I, I think the rights of the individual should be moved to the center this young person's concern should have been moved to the center instead of him asked to be moved to the margins or the edges but Mary, how do we prepare administrators and teachers and others who presumably share some of the same biases reflected in that study to be imaginative in structuring solutions that don't stigmatize. You give them as much education as possible, you give them handbooks, you give them a series of workshops, and not just one, uh, as many as you can throughout the year to give them information that will help them, and then you hold them accountable. Um, education to me is the key, and in my role as the affirmative action officer in my district, there are people who can come to me and say, Mary, this is happening, can you help me? out and that's what I do. Marianne? I think you also have to let those educators know what, when you do something like that, well you change in a separate bathroom, you do this, that's further victimizing the victim. Mm. You know, we went through that education process with rape victims, you know, we came to understand that, you know, it, it wasn't something they did but there's, there's a, a problem with people who are sexual predators. Um, but it took us a long time to stop victimizing the victim and we have to learn to do that here. You cannot separate a gay person out and victimize them. You have to make the mass or the gang mentality that wants to attack them, that wants to harass and threaten them, make them come to terms with their fears and be educated and learn to accept them into the, the gay individual, into the group, like they've learned to accept black people, like they've learned to accept Jews, like they've learned to accept handicaps, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all the different stages we've gone through in our evolutionary process. Well, human I, being. I think, I Go ahead, Mary. It's, I think it's important that we work on changing the school environment, not asking the individual to change habits or behavior. So it's working on the school environment. Mary, as, we, as we wind down, let me ask you this. Do you feel there's significant progress being made, or are we just at the beginning of a long road? I think that progress is being made. I think it's a very long and hard process. I think that we can never give up. And I think that work is being done and it can be done. We just have to keep hanging in there and working on it and never give up because there's so many kids out there that are being hurt. Rocky, are you optimistic or not? We're optimistic, but we have to have programs in effect and, of course, challenges to the board to understand the real issue.
And Marianne, I guess we started with you, I should end with you. Are you optimistic, in fact, that significant progress is being made, or do we have a long way to go? Oh, we have a long way to go, but I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll, we'll go that direction. Well, I'm thankful to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of Due Process, but you'll certainly want to join us next time when we return to the problems of sexual harassment, but on another front. Are young women being victimized by professors in our colleges? That's next time on Due Process. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. interferes with their ability to concentrate on their school uh, studies so that their grades start to drop. Uh, they then feel as if they're, it's not even worth staying in school because it's so hard to face that harassment on a daily basis. They drop out of school. Sometimes that then leads to substance abuse or worse, including uh, irresponsibility with their bodies, irresponsibility with sex, and unfortunately, in too many cases, attempted suicide and success in their attempts. Um, this, is a, this is a script I see playing out over and over again in terms of the calls that I get from parents. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.